I'm getting across the idea that all these buildings have a right to be, so to speak, a reason to live. Now this one is going to bother some of you. It's <coughs> a temple in Buffalo. So the outgrowth of some of the early ideas I had of the little chapels at the University of Illinois. I felt I'd like to have a space that surrounds you, that you don't feel confined by a ceiling, and uh, you relate to whoever is the head of the congregation. Those walls lean out, as you see. I had a, a very interesting engineer who was no longer with us said, as long as I keep the center of gravity within the base, they'll stand up. It was concrete, and then it has his face with
But something happened, and a couple of months later, they came back. Oh, I know what I did. They came back again, and I decided, well, I'm going to let fate take care of this. So I sat down, and I figured out what the <coughs> highest per diem was in New York City. And I said I would come on a minimum of 10 days, all expenses paid, portal to portal, and no right to continue if I didn't like the way it was going. And they said, come. <laughs> you try it to see if you can get away with it. <laughs> and then I went through a whole series and I came up with this idea and I decided I had to have the local architect <coughs> working with me and he gave me a lot of problems. He said, you can't do this. This is against uh, the codes and, and uh, Paris. You have to have a full line of the streets. You've heard that, you've run into that in New York City. And it was a narrow street. And I resisted it. And I started walking around the city. And it turns out that there was a small narrow street at right angles where you see the flat plane. And I also found that the Bibliotheque Nationale was also at the end of a small, small street. And it set back. And I built up a case of this not being on the street, but being on the opposite of a street at right angles. And <coughs> I elevated the working area and had the two ground floors working space and a peculiar <coughs> way of functioning there. Get some water. Here we go. <coughs> <coughs> This was essentially a private bank. Yeah. Private banks in Paris are quite different than France. Um, you don't come in to a bunch of quiches, a bunch of tellers in a big room and try and take your turn. It's more like what we have in this country in the trust offices where you come into a big space and everybody's sitting at a table greet you as, as you are some very important person and the secretary or somebody talks to you about what you was what you want to do. And in this particular space, no important person goes to the bank. He has what it calls a we say as a a we say is another word for a sophisticated messenger boy and uh, you come in down below here and you get off the car that's the black space down below underneath with your um, chauffeur the chauffeur takes the car and you do your business bringing up the elevator on the upper level I developed a big garden and on the top level was or the head of the people, and then I try to get an environment on either side, which you see the decorations of the walls. But I had an interesting interlude in a... Is, and I found that if I've learned that the average client either doesn't read drawings or is better off building models, so I've gotten the habit of always on an important building to find a way to build a model 
and drawings. Therefore, I cover myself with the trustees or whoever's talking to me, and, so, and I end up getting an understanding. And I said, could you get me $25,000 to build a model? I've had an experience that the model is very important, and I can take the model apart. So I had a model made in the United States and shipped it. And then we had a meeting with the with the, the three barons and the staff, and they started to look at it and criticize it. This, of course, is between France and here. The, the baron said to his directors, you're not the architect. Keep quiet. I'm listening to the architect. Let him speak. And, uh, and he started to listen. And he liked the idea. And he said to me, I'm having dinner with Pompidou. Pompidou is a famous name. He, well, he's dead now, but he was then uh, the premier of France. And I would like to show him this model. And he did show him the model. Came back a couple days later and said, Pompidou said, You can go ahead and build it. It doesn't follow the rules. I like the idea, and, and you have the right to do it. In those days, it's just like the president coming to the head of the building department trying to do it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened. This is the building, and it's done in, in the nice stone, and they have gardens all around, and it's quite a nice building. And it stands up in, on the avenue, and if you walk down the avenue, you'll see the, I don't know how many of you have been to France, you see the, the little colonnade and the little pediment above it. If you look down the straight line, that's the temple, if you know, above that is the famous uh, Sacre Coeur Church. <coughs> no, but it's called Rue So that's my experience with, with the French people. Now it turned out that we were in the um, sort of banking and insurance area, and there was a neighbor, the head of the second largest insurance company. In France, the head of the insurance company was appointed by the, by the uh, president of France. All of the rest of it is done as, as, a, uh, as you have a private insurance company. And they got rather interested. And about four or five years later, this is what I'm going to show you with it. There's another view you can see. The beginning of the screen on the left, I haven't shown the other, but it ends up as a marking the end of the street. And now I'll talk about this. This is another building in France. The neighbors liked it and they started wondering about wanting the Americans to be able to discover the way to do it in France. We talked about it, we had a long talk about it, and one day they came to Europe, they came to the United States, and I asked them to come to Chicago and to Boston and to New York, etc. So we had a long talk. The only funny thing that happened is my secretary came to me and said, um, you told me to get tickets for everybody. And I said, I've got the French tickets, but two of them are first class and all the rest are tourist class. And I said, we can't do that. I said, we've got to go first class. Or I'm going to make you go all first class, of course, that's what we did, but that's the way they treat. They've got an upper echelon and a lower echelon. In other words, there's still a class system in France as well as there is in English. More about people going to the universe, whereas the Burning will probably tell you more about the 
too. Uh, and uh, that was an amusing incident. And also, when they asked if I would do a building there, and I showed them the buildings, they, and this is the French insurance, number two insurance building, which is at the end of the long Champs Elysees and the Avenue. The, the Grand Army running into, into La de France, which is a, a, an extension of uh, Paris. It's all in green glass and uh, done purposely. It actually becomes the head of the composition. It's about 48 stories tall. And there are a lot of other buildings around it, but it's become kind of a mess, but anyway, disorganized, not like the French layouts. A whole more like American layouts where every inch of land has to pay its own way. Which doesn't happen in France. In France, if an area is is uh, allocated for commercial reasons, it's taxed at a certain level. And if its neighbor is supposed to be housing, the tax is definitely, the land cost is definitely lower. And you can't buy that piece of property <coughs> and build an office building on it. As you can here, if you have some housing here, and somebody says, I can use it, they grab it because they get it very cheap buy it cheap and then they end up putting a tall uh, commercial building on it and the city doesn't argue with it because the city, this city and a lot of other cities in the United States are built on real estate taxes which makes it almost impossible to have any giveaway space for communities unless you find a lot of development to do something or some other kind of space that you've had years ago want to go about the future. Whether we can ever build any spaces like that, I think we're going to have to do something about the way we plan our cities and, and avoid a situation where everything has to pay its own way. It can't be done to give the public, the public a chance of using some space that costs the city money. This is the sign here. <coughs> and now, the reason I show this, this is alcohol. This is all in, in, in aluminum. I show it because it was done essentially under the regime of Harris and the Bromovitz. I've avoided showing you anything here that is Harris and Bromovitz, so I don't get caught in a situation of usurping Wally Harrison or his ghost. And, um, and looking like now that he's gone, I can <coughs> take credit for everything. <laughs> and the reason I'm showing it is, is an interesting reason, and it'll have to do with the next building. We were asked by Alcoa to do a building and Wally developed a nice relationship with a man who later on, who had earlier been a salesman, and he and I both had developed a nice relationship. And uh, he had <clears throat> become, by this time, a number two man, later on the president of Newman Corporation. And they decided they would build a building all of them and do their own experimenting with their own material and not have to ask somebody else to do it, which was a very unusual idea. <coughs> Everything in the building except the steel columns are aluminum. They made some very interesting experiments and they gave us the money to do some very nice uh, treatment of the aluminum. This is one of the very successful aluminum buildings uh, done You'll see others, but they've taken advantage of mixing ideas with others and they've second rate. Now, along comes the 
the U.S. Steel Company. This is 10 years later. And they keep on saying that by this time, the head of the building superintendent of the Tryon and Paris Fair and myself had got very cozy in those days. He was about my age, a little older. And we had a deal between us. He said, why don't we work things out so that if you, something, you see something wrong, you tell me. And if I see something wrong, I'll tell you. We don't tell our bosses about it, and we straighten it out. <laughs> Which we did. <laughs> and it worked very well. Anyway, they kept on talking to me about a steel they were getting concerned about the steel industry was about higher strength steel in Europe, which meant people were transporting steel here. Uh, having to reinforce it, which was a problem. And, and I kept on saying to this young man who now was my age, not a young man, and he was the executive VP, and I kept on saying, listen, we can't find a client to start experimenting with your building. You've got to do something with alcohol again. You've got to convince your own people that if you want an all-steel building and you want to push your material, that you've got to get involved. Well, one day he came in to see me and he says, I've sold the idea. The head of engineering will give you so much money to spend, it took a year to do research about steel, how we build the steel, how we, how, how we build steel, how we teach about steel. It was a very thorough study of the use of steel, the fireproofing, <laughs> installation, etc. And this is the end result. The reason I showed you the Alcoa building is because it led to this building. Now this is an interesting building. Uh, there haven't been very many buildings like it, but again, it talks specifically about how it was built. The verticals are exterior columns. There are no columns on the inside of the building. I had, now, this again, I picked what I call one of the brightest structural engines. They said, put a team together, so I got myself. <coughs> the brightest mechanical engineers I could get. The brightest structural engineers. They gave me the right to do that. We started working very carefully about how to build the building. We analyzed square buildings, rectangular buildings, round buildings, triangular buildings. We tried everything. And we analyzed the cost of the steel, the strength of the steel, how to build the steel. We changed the handbooks, passed them around to the university. They talked about how they did their steel <coughs> railroad cars, etc. And we went together and came up with this kind of a building. First, we came to the conclusion that we had to take advantage of triangular theory. Again, triangular theory. No matter which way the wind came at you, you always had a stiff leg to stop the wind. You would never have a building going over like this because you always had one leg picking up and they were tied together. That explained that actually there are three 10,000 units against the triangular core and with ideal space, and you'll see it in a minute. The other thing is we had learned that Italy was experimenting with columns and had learned 
that if you took a steel column and put it far enough from a wall, you would get enough protection against fire equivalent to reinforcement, which costs money, etc. And these verticals are three feet out from the building. And then wall is all windows. The, they're built in three-story units. Now, why three stories? Because you build the first two stories that are structural, and the third one is a three-story. So you can do a three. Now, these are all tied up with the cost of steel. Now, then we run in, ran into the building department. In the U.S. Steel Building, U.S. people, and all of the big companies have a lot of clout in Pittsburgh, and they can always make the building part of anything they want to do. And they thought they had the steel, steel the building department, <coughs> in their pocket. And they said, yes, yes, and all of a sudden they balked. And it caused a worry about the fact that there's no fireproofing around the steel. Somebody came up with a brilliant idea, not mine. Why don't we put water inside these outer columns and later on antifreeze? <laughs> Those columns have all water and antifreeze in And they're built in three tiers, and they have rings every third tier, which tie them together and are held together by <coughs> the top. And it ended up as an exciting experience and another, <coughs> another way of building. Of course, this has nothing to do with how you live in the building. But it found again. My desire to have something that had ideas to it, not just do something quickly because that's the easiest thing to do. Now, this shows you an elephant. It just shows a, a space. The black is full of elevators and, and service space, etc. And the rectangles on either side, and there's no columns. Notice the steel columns on the exterior, and that is your building. And then the next problem was parking, and I said, can't we have a plaza in that crowd this Talking to a wealthy, then a wealthy, now quite different. So we have this big plaza, there's a big fountain where the word plaza exists. And it's uh, a great building. And a special piece in, uh, in Pittsburgh. But again, I'm going back to trying to do something with ideas and not just shut another big building up. And I'll show you another big building that anybody can do. There it is. I have a helicopter on top of it. I have the air conditioning up above, inside at the first level, and uh, it sits in its own environment, and is seen everywhere. Now this is a, comp uh, a complex I did at the University of Iowa. They got interested in what was going on at the University of Illinois and, uh, and one of the vice presidents came and talked to me and asked me lots of questions. The building on the extreme right is a concert opera house facing the park. The building on the left is a music school that runs across and the river runs alongside and I proposed it along the river, and it's a pretty interesting building. 
to show you. He made one mistake, which I did. This is the view at night. And uh, the mistake I made is I thought I was being smart by putting the cooling tower and everything else way up on top of the stage house. It's 
step over the FDR drive, and it's all eliminated between except still on the side. And I hope to continue this on the <coughs>
you know, I had to agree on, which explains why the materials are the same, and I'll tell you more about that later on. And the thought was that Phillips would be glass on one way of the sides and glass only on the other side. Well, all these states glass, but this is the image. And if you, and I'm showing this, and I'm willing to respond to questions. Your director asked me to be ready to, and I'll show you the rest of the buildings. Um, there's, again, the opera, and there is the reflect of the pool around which Philip designed. And the space, incidentally, is a space very much like, very much like this is where our history comes in. Uh, in Cappadocia in Rome, the hardest thing I had when I was in Paris traveling around, I spent a lot of time going all over Europe and elsewhere and trying to study spaces because I learned that we had no idea of what to do in the space. We had to be trained about space, how big the space is, how, how do you compose it, etc. We always tried to use the very space with the park in front of it. I made a mistake doing it or not a mistake, I did a nice little embassy building <coughs> and before Castro got control of Cuba, and I had two courts in it, a big court and a little court. It turned out after it was built, the little court was too small and the big court was the right size. In other words, learning something. And we used to relate to what we saw is one of the spaces that I think makes a space rather intimate. This again is the film on it, the light at night with people in it. And this is the hall with the overhanging out who's looking over it. I have a, another picture which exists somewhere fully people
this says it cost them the policing coverage. And also this for security reasons. Thank you. 